today's um, today's scripture is from Luke chapter 1, five, verses 5 through 16, 24 and 25. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife was a descendant of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous before God, blaming, living blamelessly according to all of the commandments and regulations of the Lord. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren, and both were getting on in years. Once when he was serving as priest before God and his section was on duty, he was chosen by, by lot according to the customs of priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and offer incense. Now at, at the time of the incense offering, the whole assembly of people was praying outside. Then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zachariah saw him, he was terrified. The fear over, overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zachariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink. Even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. After do, those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she remained in seclusion. She said, This is what the Lord has done for me when he looked favorably on me and took away the grace I have endured among my people. The, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I'd like to introduce our speaking pastor, Chris Yost. All right. Thank you, Chris. And thank you to all the MCs who come up and help lead worship. You know they're folks just like you, but they have a calling on their lives to help lead worship. And so people like Chris um, go through and we have some training for them and uh, we get them employed up here. If you are one of those folks, I'm the guy that you would contact. I actually personally train each one of the MCs. So if that's something you're interested in, this is him. Come talk to me. We'd love to help you get uh, in that ministry. Um, folks, this is absolutely the most exciting time of the year. Now, at Easter, I'm going to tell you the same thing. Don't hold me to that. But right here today, this is the most exciting time of the year. I think there's so much that gets um, kind of uh, crammed into this season that we get these very, and I will use the word precious, moments in time where we can stop, be reconnected to what God is seeking to do in our lives throughout this kind of a season so that when we go out there to re-engage with a world that we do love to be a part of, we can do so with God's grace and God's presence in, in, in us and at work among us. Before we get too far into uh, today's message today on hope, I want to offer you, to you a moment of silent prayer. If you brought something that you'd like to lift up before God, this is your opportunity to do that. Then we'll gather uh, and, uh, and for hearing God's word. So let's take a moment in silent prayer. Lord, we gather in this time and in this place, hopefully with fresh good memories on our hearts, some of us, God, still with a sense of indigestion, hopefully with full bellies, but God, our souls, they need to be fed. We're here, God, to feast upon your word, which only you can provide to us. So God, we ask that you would open up our hearts and our minds and our souls and the ministry of your word. And I do pray, God, that you would hide me behind the cross and allow your living water to flood this earth and vessel. Amen. So as we get started, um, I want to just put that word hope right in front of you. Whenever we say the word hope, what do you think of? If you're a child, I remember as a child going through and, um, you know, they'd have those little gumball machines and all the little trinket machines at Kmart because in uh, Pottsboro, Texas, 
Kmart was the closest thing nearby to go shopping at. And I remember going to Kmart and I would hope to find a quarter somewhere. Or I would hope for my dad to give me a quarter. And I would go to the machine and I would exercise what I thought hope was once again because, you know, there was always that sticker that I had to have for my collection. And there was always that compass you know those little plastic compasses? I always wanted one of those compasses. And I would go up to the machine and I would make sure I was at the right machine. And I would put in my quarter and I would twist it. And then there was that great clunk sound. And I would lift it up and without fail it would be a strawberry shortcake <laughs> sticker. And so then I'd wait for the next time. And we'd go the next week, and I'd look over them again, because every now and then they switched them out, so you couldn't just go to the same one. And I remember turning, and i got to tell you, one day I finally got the compass. That was my goal, because, you know, I was going to be an explorer. I was going to search the world for whatever. And I got the compass, and wouldn't you know it, it was not magnetized. It literally sat there, and you could hold the little bottom and spin it around, and you go whatever direction you wanted. You want to talk about hope deferred. I experienced it on that day. Hope is one of those mixed metaphor kind of words. We, sometimes we, um, if we're really serious about the word hope, it's, it's risky, isn't it? We risk something of ourselves if we really and truly hope for something. But I want to tell you, before we even get into the Scripture text today, hope is a lot more about what we put our faith and trust in than it is even what we're hoping for. Gumball machines for kids, it's fine. It's definitely a lesson learned. But what are we put our hope and our faith in makes all the difference. Because if you're jaded at just the word hope right now, and some of you are, and I can tell you I've been there. Uh, People use the word hope, and I think, yeah, I once hoped. What I had to realize was a lot of times my hope was in the wrong thing. It was in the wrong stuff. Literally, I want to tell you a song song of hope. That was a great, great song. Um, I want to tell you a quick story of hope because it's fresh. Um, A month and a half ago, Crossway, we were still in the elementary school And we were trying to raise money to get all these renovations done and get everything set up. And do you know that Crossway was almost $10,000 behind one month? Now, how many of you knew that? It's probably about five hands that should go up, right? Well, there's a few more. Okay? We really didn't tell anybody because we really didn't want to squash what God was doing among us, right? There's all this stuff going on. We're raising money for the transition fund. But I got to tell you, as a as a pastor in charge, it gets pretty nerve wracking when you have a staff meeting and you go, oh, my gosh, are we even going to be able to pay these folks? I got to tell you, I was very nervous. I was very, very nervous. And I'd shared this story with some of my covenant group and some of my people. And I just said, folks, I need some prayer. We have got to pray that God delivers right now because we got a lot of things trying to fit through the eye of the needle and they're not fitting. We need a miracle. I am not kidding you. Three days later, a distant friend of mine called and said, I want you to meet me for breakfast. Now, this is the kind of friend that if they called, I would go meet them anytime. But they said, come meet me for breakfast. And this took some effort. It was extremely busy. But I went and I sat with my friend and we were just kind of chit-chatting and all this stuff like we normally would. And then my friend says, um, our family every year picks a cause that we think is building up the kingdom of God. It's never our church. It's always somebody else's church, somebody other um, uh, institution that we believe God is really using right now. And we picked your church. It's a little bit before Christmas. But we know where you're at. We believe in what God is doing through you and through the church that you're serving So here you go. Now, I don't know if you've ever been slid in a check before. There's a little bit of this awkwardness to that. (laughs) Because you want to look. But it's not about the looking. Someone has just given a gift to the work of Jesus Christ. And so what I've started to do now when that happens is say, I'm not even going to look. I'm going to say thank you. And we've been friends long enough. He goes, you need to look. (laughs) I open it up as 15,000 bucks. 
folks that got us through last month, that's helped us get into this month. But I got to tell you, that was one of those tangible times, and it's not about the dollars and cents as much as it is the ability that we have to be here today. Hope. Hoping in God and hoping what God can be doing in our lives and in our communities among us today. Folks, it is the object of our hope that makes all the difference. Hope sometimes finds itself deferred. And that's where we pick up this story today where Zechariah has gone to the temple to do the priestly work that he was called to. And actually, that's called to. We think about uh, maybe you know, God coming up and saying, you know, Donna, go into ministry, right? Um, <laughs> she's like, I don't think so. Touche, <laughs> touche. Zechariah is born into the right kind of family. Back in the, these days, um, a calling was if you had the right last name. If you were born into the right kind of family, your career was pretty set. There really was not go out and find yourself, all right? But Zechariah is listed in the Scriptures. He and Elizabeth both are very devout people. They're righteous, which is a rare word to be used of anyone in Luke's Gospel. But they're declared to be righteous. In other words, that doesn't mean they don't ever mess up, but that means that they are in alignment. They are in alignment with God in their day-to-day lives. And so they're living faithfully. And I imagine it was very perplexing for people in their day to see them endure something. And when I say endure something, remember this is in a pre-scientific era where the idea of children coming along had to have been the direct work of God. And so for Zechariah and Elizabeth to not have children in that day no longer, by the way, was considered a curse. Remember a couple weeks ago, we talked about the disillusionment of people who think if you do good, you get good. You do bad, you get bad. Well, this was one of those, the world's upside down things. How could Zachariah and Elizabeth not have a whole, a whole host at their table at Thanksgiving? How could that happen? They're the right people. They're good people. They're God-loving people. How is this possible? It didn't make sense. Nevertheless, they're faithful. They continue their work, their worship, their uh, leadership of, of, of the, the, their church, the temple, the community. And Zechariah goes in to do just the regular work of God. And that's where in the text we kind of jumped over. It got a little bit wordy, so I had Chris skip over a section. I commend it to you to read later. But Zechariah goes in to the Holy of Holies to present the offering to God. And in there, the text tells us that the angel Gabriel appeared. Appeared to the right side of the altar. And there he was and begins to speak God's fulfillment of hope into Zechariah's life. Now for him, this is a mixed bag. For him and Elizabeth, this is a mixed bag. You see, on one hand, they're dealing with this, we really want to have kids, but now I think Elizabeth, let's just put some, this is not official, okay? Everybody with me? You with me? This is not official. Let's say Elizabeth's 50 and Zechariah's 60. Most of us would say that's heart attack age to have kids in our era, right? But they've been hopeful all along and they've been waiting. And just maybe, well, that ship had kind of sailed, right? That ship had moved on. But the reason I say it's a mixed bag for them is they're also devoutly Jewish. And you see, God's word of hope had been active for 12, 1400 years, very, very actively. God had done some amazing stuff in the, in the nation of Israel raised up mighty prophets and mighty kings and judges and armies and had conquered land and oh gosh and then they got conquered and then they got hauled off into exile and then some people came back and well they built another temple and for about 350 years no one had heard a peep air quotes no one had heard anything from God Malachi was the last prophet to be known of And yet there were these promises that God had made to the nation 
of Israel. That there would be a day where there would be a king who would remain on the throne forever. That there would be the opportunity for peace for all who called upon the name of the Lord. That people would know the joy of God's immediate presence. That no longer a person would have to go into a specific time and a specific place for us on the whole other side of the world in Jerusalem to worship God. That people could worship God wherever two or three or more were gathered in the name of the Lord. And all these hopes and promises had been cultivated and passed on from generation to generation And here they were in a season where they hadn't seen God do anything big in a really, really long time. I think I would be pretty jaded by then. Several hundred years since the last time they'd seen God do something amazing. Is it just a fairy tale, they would say? Is it just a story that was passed on and does it really have no meaning for us anymore? I don't know, I'd be probably a little bit tempted to get to that place. Maybe it's just a fanciful thing to get us through the tough times. And then Zechariah walks in. Bam! The angel of the Lord appears to him. This is Gabriel, alright? This is the one who intercedes or is directly in the immediate presence of God and hears directly from God and communicates the mind of God to the receiver. You're going to hear about Gabriel here in another two weeks. But today he says to him, your hope, your prayer, it's been heard. And not only has it been heard, guess what? You're going to have a baby. Now like I said, if any of us that were 60 years old heard that today, we'd probably kind of faint over just a little bit, right? You'd think Zechariah would go running out and the part that we skipped a little bit of, um, it turns out that because he, he goes through and he says, that's not possible. Gabriel, you kind of seen what you're dealing with here. <laughs> that's not happening. Gabriel says, because you haven't believed, you're going to be silent until this child is born. That's a whole other message. But basically, Zechariah walks out of the temple with all this experience And normally when the priest comes out, they would pronounce the the numbers blessing or the Aaronic blessing upon the people. He comes out and he goes. And they know something's happened because no one would not do what he was supposed to do. Hope was being nurtured and kindled, not just for Zechariah and Elizabeth, but for the entire nation of Israel. And again, talk about hope promised and hope beginning to be fulfilled. There was a promise that all the world could know of God's immediate presence and love and mercy. And so we see that there's this, um, uh, um, it's like a bucket flowing over effect. It might be happening with Zechariah and Elizabeth, but folks, when God begins to pour out the fulfillment of hope into our lives, it flows over. And in their case, it flowed over into all the globe. This little boy, John, was going to be the messenger of the Lord. This little boy, John, was going to literally pave the way in modern parlance. He was going to get things set. Because God was going to deliver on the biggest promise God had ever made. That you and I could come home. That you and I could know the immediate presence of God. So you know, i got to wonder, if Zechariah and Elizabeth had placed all their faith in, if we have a baby, God is faithful. What would have happened? We kind of understand that A, they didn't have gumball machines back then. But if Zechariah and Elizabeth had place their faith in getting the right thing to come out of the gumball machine, they would have been deeply disappointed. But you see, as righteous people, their ongoing and living hope was in God. Oh, there were things they hoped for. Obviously, they had prayed about this child thing. But you see, God was fulfilling A hope 
bigger than them. Any of you ever read the Old Testament? Anybody ever read the Old Testament? Some of these names might sound a little bit familiar to you. Abraham and Sarah. Anybody remember Abraham and Sarah? All right, Abraham, Sarah, were they of the right age to have kids? No, that's right. No, Abraham and Sarah, they shouldn't have been doing that. No pun intended. Whoops. Jeff, can you edit that? <laughs> All right, never mind. Moving on. Isaac and Rebecca. Isaac and Rebecca. Remember them? Yeah, they, were, they couldn't have kids. Anybody remember a lady named Hannah? Oh my gosh, what a moving story. Woman who goes through and says, I'm the literally and bless her little heart. She says, I'm the disgrace of everybody, God, please. And she goes through and she kind of makes a little deal, which I don't always encourage, but it worked, to, so whatever. But Hannah says, if I can have a son, I will dedicate my son to your service forever. And if you're an Old Testament reader, you remember this young man named Samuel? Samuel grows up to be the last big time awesome prophet. I mean, there's ones later, but in the line of the judges and prophets, Samuel anoints David. Um, David is the greatest king in Israel's history, blah, blah, blah. God is in a pattern of fulfilling deferred hopes. God is continuing today to fulfill hopes that were deferred. This is not a matter of causality. This is not a matter of God saying this person can't have kids until they trust me good. Are you with me on that? This is not a matter of God um, uh, of causality to where God's going to hold you in punishment until you get this thing right. But I will tell you that when our lives are in alignment with what God is seeking to do among us, you will see the barren family have kids. When we find ourselves walking in the pathway of God, you do see doors open that we didn't even know existed. That's the kind of God that we serve. That's the kind of people that we are. That's the kind of church that we dream to be where we find ourselves walking in alignment with God. Then we see all of these things at work among us. I don't know how it works. I wish I could tell you. I don't know if it's a matter of perspective and that now we can see different. It might be some of that. I don't know if it's that all of a sudden we become vessels where the Holy Spirit works in ways that defy science or explanation. All I can tell you is it works. Thousands of years now, God's been doing this. And this season of hope, this season of Advent, we continue in that same vein. Closing story. As a clergy person, um, I have uh, I've been with a lot of people through a lot of tough stuff. Um, I've seen times where we prayed by the bedsides of the sick and their healing was not on this side of heaven. I've also prayed with people who literally got up and walked in ways that I can't imagine or fathom. But I'll tell you, at some point, you kind of make your peace with how God does and doesn't work in our world. And um, our family, um, about nine and a half, ten years ago, went through some really, really difficult medical stuff. And um, I remember, <laughs> uh, also this is important to say, my, my previous background was in uh, nuclear power and, and engineering. And so um, I have a very easily can step into a deep science mind pretty quick. So um, we go through all this medical stuff, and I'm kind of operating out of this um, science mind, and um, we began to see some things happen that really shouldn't have been happening considering the diagnosis, and they were good things, okay? Um, literally, and I don't use this word ever lightly, but a physical healing type thing was happening way quicker than it should have ever happened, and I sat with this brilliant, brilliant surgeon, um, uh, Dr. Catherine Bass. 
And I remember saying to Dr. Bass, did you diagnose this correctly the first time? Because we shouldn't be at this place of healing already. And she said, yes, yes, Mr. Yost, we, we have all of the diagnosis. Here are the charts. This is classic, da 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 And um, I was like, okay, but um, so did we do some medical treatment on this or healing stuff that, that really made this, um, what, what's the explanation behind it? And this goes back and forth for probably about 12 minutes. She finally looks across the table she says, Reverend Yost, aren't you the pastor? <laughs> oh! Aren't you the pastor? Imagine being a part of what God is doing where people look at you and say, aren't you the Christian? Aren't you the person of hope? Kind of funny when it's somebody else, right? My hope and my dream for you this Advent is that as stories of hope happen among you and in you and through you that you get the privilege we're saying that doesn't quite make sense and somebody to look you dead in the eyes and say but aren't you the jesus follower i want you to go yeah i should have expected hope to be delivered on let's pray god it's amazing that we get to be on this journey god it would be kind of nice sometimes if we could just box up what you're doing and figure it all out and just hand it out like little gift wrap packages that'll be around our trees soon but god you do it in ways that we can't take credit for god you do it in ways that we're perpetually surprised when you come to deliver on promises god for each person in here today i help i pray that the a spark of hope would be fanned into flame. That God, for those persons who have, life's just taught them to be jaded on such a topic. That you would give them some small spot to start back. To begin again. Or to know for the first time what it is to not have hope in some random thing, but rather to know hope in you. So that they can know that that hope is never deferred. It's not delayed. It's real and it's present. God, we ask that you make us mindful as we journey through this Advent season of how we can offer hope to others. Inspire us, God, that we might be the answer to prayer to someone else who doesn't know where the next meal or where the gifts for the kids or where the next job is going to come from, that we can be your vessel to help answer their prayers. Because God, of course, in this room, we're your children. But God, you have children all over this planet. Some of them are lost. Some of them are just walking on the path that the world's thrown in front of them. And may not know that you have a bigger, better, more beautiful way for us to, to tread. So God, as your kids, we thank you for your love and your mercy. We ask that you help us to share it with others. Because we're your kids. And you're our daddy. And it's in that spirit that we pray as you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.